YouTubers, welcome back to my channel. Um, hello, do you see um, the sign behind me? Yeah. So that means today is technically May 10th, but you might see this tomorrow or in a couple days. Happy birthday to me. I had an awesome birthday and I had something like super kind of important that I really wanted to chat with you guys about. So let's get to it. <clears throat> so first thing you guys have been like, when are you going to do uploads? Like, are you doing uploads like Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays? Like, what's the deal? So I had to go over like my, my analysis on like Google and, and YouTube and according to my analysis for you guys, I should be doing uploads like Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. But things are just going to come up, man, you know? Like, definitely ex always expect like two or three uploads on the weekends for sure. I was going to do Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but... It seems like you guys really just watch, you know, YouTube on the weekends and like super late at night. Why aren't you guys in bed? All right, so something I wanted to chat about that I thought was pretty important and I didn't really want to wait at all. I had, God, I think like 17 messages between like email and Instagram and Facebook and just you guys kind of like blew me up um, immediately when the final when the season finale episode of Deadly Possessions aired and the biggest thing everybody wanted to know was the girl that was named Annie was she um, real everyone was you know expressing opinions as far as why is she seem to be afraid of a doorknob jiggling but then she jumps in the van and everyone was kind of under the assumption that you know it was not a legitimate situation uh, and that she possibly was hired as like an actress or an actor and I would like to say that I did do my research I um, I looked up her name and I couldn't find this person exist in Michigan I think that the reason that you guys, like, I feel like I have such, like, faithful followers. Like, I love all of you guys, and I do not, you know, take any of you for granted. And I think the reason that all of you respect my opinion is, one, you know, I'm super passionate and hardcore about the paranormal. I'm definitely, you know, a believer for sure. Obviously, you guys have seen the experiences that I've had on my YouTube channel, but I am also a skeptic when it comes to things. And, and even just a story like this was presented, I was skeptical as well. I look at things from both sides, like believer and skeptic, but I really want to just get the truth, whatever that means. I think the reason that you guys also respect me is that you know that I've been doing production and not just as a producer in just general film, but I've done you know, I've been working on sets for paranormal production specifically with all different projects. So you guys know that I know my shit. And I think that you guys really like the fact that like I never sugarcoat anything with you. And when I call a spade a spade, I'm calling it for what I see it. And I will never like lie to you guys or, you know, fib out like what I really truly believe. And I'll always respect your opinions and stuff, but for the most part, you guys know that I'm not gonna like beat around the bush and like bullshit you, you know what I mean? So with that being said, first of all, I love you guys for, for subs that are subscribers. Some of you aren't even subscribers and you just check back constantly, so I love you guys for that. But let's just kind of get to the bottom of this little chat and discussion what's about to go down. So the question of the night was, was this girl Annie real or not? And <clears throat> let's talk about why we believed that she was definitely a extra or a hired actress. So the footage was was kind of all over the place. So she comes on and she chats about that she lives in um, Dr. Kevorkian's old house, okay? In the meantime, we had also seen the lawyer that was the real legitimate real life lawyer of Dr. Kevorkian. 
Dr. Kevorkian's lawyer says that he owned a house on the lake of what I found to be Lake Orion, which is in Michigan. And then they bring on Annie and they don't clarify that um, this is the same house or a different house. So as a audience, the way it was edited, we assume that they are discussing the exact same house that the lawyer was talking about, okay? Or at least I did. Maybe I just pay attention to too much detail in production. The next thing that happens is they have B-roll footage of a door shaking, a doorknob shaking, and then you have Annie talking about her firsthand experience, which is, it was in my bedroom, it was the first thing that happened, and it really scared me, okay? And, you know, there was a couple other things that they chatted about in between, but then all of a sudden, Zach's like, all right, I want to send you into the room where, you know, we have the van of Dr. Kevorkian and I want to see if you can make contact. Now, on previous episodes of Deadly Possessions, people that were, you know, interactive, like let's say with the doll Peggy, right? The girl that thought that she had like some serious attachment to Peggy had to go sit down and do the seance and she was terrified, right? Like she was uberly terrified of the doll. And she's crying and she's distraught and she's like doesn't really want to be around it. She's physically like trembling and shaking in the room. So as audience members and as a producer watching this, I'm under the assumption that Annie is going to freak out. If she's having a hard time seeing a door handle shake, how is she going to go in here and investigate Dr. Kevorkian's van? This is the same thing that all of you guys that emailed me. And I'm sorry that I haven't you know, written you back individually. I wanted to address this as a whole right now or else I would have had to write 17 emails. So the next scene that we see is Annie and she's like asking questions to Dr. Kevorkian. She's got a digital recorder. She's very clear. She's really great at investigating and she hops in the van and slams the door. And you even get to see this cut footage of Zach laughing and he's like, she's gonna get in the van? You know, like question mark, like he's shocked about it, okay? Like he's laughing. And so we're sitting here and we're like, there's like a thump and there's a bang and Annie's calling it out. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, wait a second. Annie was afraid of a door handle. They have not spoke of her being an invest a seasoned paranormal investigator. Why is she just jumping in the van like this? So I, the show ends, it was a great episode, whatever. And so what, do, what am I doing? What do you guys know I'm doing? I am researching to find out what this was about, what's going on here. So I find out that the lawyer lived in Lake Orion, right? Like you guys know I have a full on production team that works with me, right? Like I have PAs, which are production assistants because I own my own production company. I've told you guys that like I do editing and post-production and I'm a producer on set for shows. I, I do this stuff physically hands-on, okay? So I have a team and I love my team. You guys know that I love my team. In fact, they gave me this beautiful damn cup that I'm so proud of. I'm, I've got all of my crew working and we're like, let's find some stuff, let's dig some stuff up. What are we gonna find out, okay? And we find out somebody named Annie St. John does not exist. She does not exist, okay? We did find an Annie St. John, older lady that lived near Lake Orion, who now lives somewhere really far away in Europe, like Denmark, or I can't even remember. So I'm gonna call a spade a spade, right? I'm gonna say this person's name doesn't come up. I did a Google image search. I didn't find anything in relation to her facial structure. And, uh,. I don't really buy the fact that she was afraid of a door handle with no kind of background evidence that she is professional at this and so she hops in the van and I'm like, no way man, this chick was hired, she's an extra, sorry, that's just what I think. So lo and behold, a few hours after the video is posted or maybe that evening, I get a message from someone that says she's Annie and I look at her page and I'm like, damn, this girl is Annie. And she tore, tore me apart a little bit, I'm gonna be honest. I got torn apart. She was pissed. She was pissed at my review. She was mad that I said she was not real. She was mad that I said she was an investigator. She was mad that um, she thought that I basically told her she was not a confident investigator, which I never believe I said that. And she was pissed. She left me this big old long comment. And you know, most of the time when I get hate mail, 
especially if it's negative. First, you guys know that I do not tolerate trolling or bullying on my channel. I don't care. People laugh sometimes and I'll get comments that are like, oh, must be hard to control that. Actually, it's not. In fact, the, the trolling and bullying on this channel has significantly cut down because people know I'm not going to tolerate it. I don't care. If you want to have something horrible, mean, ugly to say, and sometimes it's not even in correlation to paranormal, go post it somewhere else because I don't have time for this. And I don't want abuser, you know, I don't want subscribers abusing each other back and forth, which you guys are awesome. You never do that. So I'm, I'm reading through this and I'm checking out her page and I'm like, okay, this chick's real. This is the girl that was on the show, and now I can finally correlate what's going on. So first and foremost, Annie, I would like to tell you that I am sorry from you know myself that I didn't think you were real, but you have to understand why I believed that that was an actual fact. Annie did come forward and tell me that her real name is not Annie. I am not gonna share with you what her real name is because that's not my job, and. I'm a producer, so I understand when certain things need to be kept private. I haven't signed confidentiality with her, which is like legality paperwork. So I'm not going to release her real name, but that's why she claims I couldn't find her. However, that means I was right, right? We did our research. We couldn't find her. It was legitimate that that person by that name was not found. Apparently, the name she went by on the show is some sort of a nickname she's had since she was a child. Second thing I would like to address is apparently I did the Google image search with her photo, which was a snapshot that we took. I was trying to find her on Google. She gave me a very big lesson on Google image search that I, I apparently never knew that definition, which I am very appreciative of because I didn't know that detail before. So apparently when I used that photo, um, it, it wouldn't have pulled that up anyways because um, it's not the exact photo even though I did also search a facial recognition search, which brings up any photo online that has the same bone structure of the person. So I don't know, I guess it's a, you know, beg to differ sort of option idea there. So she also clarified with me that she does not live in the same house that the lawyer lived in. She lives in the house that was the, next to the one of the last that he lived in before he died, okay, Dr. Kevorkian. Um, that is the house that she claims is haunted, that she lives in right now. That was not made clear on the episode. The next thing she told me, which I'm not sure if she was supposed to tell me or not, I haven't seen her contract, however, the statement that she gave me was written by her on my Google page, or on my YouTube page. So it was made public and it was edited and, and made by her. So. She released this information willingly, so that's not, I don't know what her contract says. That's between her and the production company. I'm not sure if she was supposed to disclose this or not. I'm assuming she was not supposed to disclose this. I have since deleted this from the page. She did inform me the reason, one of the reasons she was very upset was because I said she was an actor or she was a, I said she was an actor or a paid extra. She informed me that she did not make a dime working on this project, being on Deadly Possessions. She informed me she was not paid and she didn't make a dime. And she said that she came out solely to help with the investigation by choice. She also called me out for saying that she was not confident. Um, she was not a confident investigator. Hold up. How many of you have watched my videos and how many of you know how much of a hardcore, practically paranormal feminist I am and how upset I was when Paranormal Lockdown came out with Katrina and Nick and how much I wanted Katrina to stand out over Nick? How many times have I said that? I never, ever, ever demeaned a female investigator, ever. In fact, I am mad and upset, as you guys know, as my subscribers, that there should be more female investigators. And why is it so male-dominated? It should not be this male-dominated of an industry, honestly. So I never said this person was incompetent or didn't know what they were doing. I just said, by the way it looked, she went from a scary, shaking door handle to going into this hardcore investigation, which she did great, right? She did great. She knew what she was doing, which is why I thought she was an actress because I'm like, 
how, you know, a normal investigator, seasoned investigator would not be afraid of a door handle and then jump inside of a van to investigate Dr. Kevorkian. I'm sorry. For the record, I never said you were not a confident investigator. Now that I know your story, you're obviously a very confident investigator. You know what you're doing. But I hate to say this, but that is not how you were portrayed on the video. That is not how you were portrayed on the documentary or the episode, whatever you want to call it. She also said she didn't understand why I thought it was so unbelievable. I didn't use that term, you did, but I will, I'll address it. I thought it was so unbelievable because I have been doing investigating for so long. I've done paranormal production for so long professionally in the actual industry and I see someone afraid of a door handle that's gonna hop inside of a van that all of a sudden knows what they're doing, and I'm like, this does not make sense. This doesn't correlate, which is why we researched you, because I was like, we need to look this person up to see if this is legitimate. You know, obviously, does she have paranormal background experience? And then when your name doesn't come up and I can't find any experience on you, I'm like, this isn't, this is not legit. I didn't use the word unbelievable though. I just didn't think it was legitimate. Now, I'm gonna chat and say a couple of things, which is, I really feel important to everybody that's watching. How many times, over and over and over and over, have I told you guys, post-production, You'll never know what's gonna happen with post-production, ever. Unless you're there, sitting there as either the post-production manager or an editor or the executive producer and you're watching this be edited and become edited or if you sign sort of some documentation that says I want to be portrayed in this way or if you don't sign it, that means post-production has your ass in a ringer. And by that, I mean they can do whatever they want with your image. They can edit everything you did and said and make it exactly the way they want it to look. It doesn't matter. You're right, it sucks. It sucks so, so bad. And that's why people should have agents, <laughs> honestly. Like, you should not sign filming contracts unless you have an agent or unless you've done this, you know, a few times over and over again. Honestly, I got attacked. She admitted that she attacked me. She apologized. She attacked me. Understand that I was only reviewing this episode by evidence of, you know, researching and by what I witnessed on television, which is how it was edited in the end. I apologize. I will apologize again, but you can't blame me because A, I was only going off by what I saw and what we researched, and B, if you want to be upset at someone, you need to get a hold of the production company and you need to be upset with them for portraying you in that way. My video got flagged from last the last Deadly Possessions um, episode that I, I posted for you guys. I'm not pointing any fingers. I don't know who it was. However, it, her photo was the one that was flagged um, saying basically that Travel Channel had the rights. They're not forcing me to take it down. I just don't, um, I don't get to put monetization or anything like that on it. I also was kind of told not to, to use those images anymore. I was kind of like slapped on the hand for it. Um, so that's cool. It makes me upset. And, and here's the reason. I don't want to be somebody's kicking post when it's not my fault. I don't work for the Travel Channel. I don't work for Zach. I don't work for his production company. I am definitely not on his post-production team. So rather than using me as the kicking post, people, if they get upset with what they see, they need to take it up with the production company. I have educated you guys on this so, so many times. Another thing that I have to address is there are people out there, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone specifically, but there are people out there that are so desperate to become famous, they will do anything they can to get the slightest bit of television time, okay? Even if it's, it doesn't make you look good. Do you guys remember me telling you I have quit several paranormal shows that I have been in contract for because they wanted me to be scripted? I don't, I will not be scripted. I will not look fake. I want to be a part of the post-production, 
because I don't want anything to look stupid or fake or illegitimate or whatever words you want to use, right? I have educated you guys on this. No one should ever be so, you know, trying to get on a show that they don't accept funding to do something like this. I don't know how many people have gone on, on Deadly Possessions that haven't been paid, okay? I'm under the assumption if, if she wasn't paid, no one has been paid so far. I don't know though, I can't say that for a fact. I don't, I don't see contracts for every person that's been on there. But I will say this, never, ever, ever, ever do a show and sell yourself short and not be paid to, to do your work for this. You're flying from Michigan all the way to Las Vegas it, I don't even know if her travel was comped, guys. Like, it sounds like she said she volunteered to do this. So under that wording, it was not comped. So I, I am so sad for her, to be honest. Like, you go on a television show, you, and, and you know what? I was on Paranormal Challenge. I got a full hour in of, of television time, right, with my team. I was on Paranormal Challenge, and we were not comped for driving all the way from Colorado to... Jerome. So that would not surprise me. I had to drive from Denver all the way to Arizona because when we found out that we were finally cast for that position on Paranormal Challenge, we had like three days to leave. At that time, airline tickets were up the wazoo, if you know what I mean, and we're talking like a thousand dollars each way back and forth. We couldn't afford it. I mean, at the time, I was like in my mid-early 20s and you know, you're not really responsible with finances at that point. So it was cheaper for our team to rent a car and drive out there. We didn't get paid for that part. We did not get comp for that part. You don't want to sell yourself short, you know, just to get on, get on a TV show and, and you know, you don't get a dime off of it because I think that I was on set for Paranormal Challenge for like five or six days. We were compensated uh, for the time that we were like filming and the days that we were there. I would never, ever, ever, especially being a producer doing production, I would never go on a show, which I'm assuming it took one to two days to film that and not be paid for it. And it shocks me even more in so many ways that like, Zach paid $32,500 for a Volkswagen bus that is rotting away like before our eyes plus he can't fix it up at this point because it won't be of value because it needs to be directly from dr kevorkian right so he's paid thirty two thousand dollars for a van that's that's rotten and he's not paying his people to come on tv you know not even like a couple grand you can't spot him a couple thousand dollars i know for a fact i know for a fact when Mark and Debbie Constantino would go on Zach's show on like Ghost Adventures as guests or like Dave Schrader or any of the other people that they would have on as celebrity guests, I know for a fact that they would get paid between $3,500 to $5,500 per episode. So I know that there's finances there, obviously if we can afford a $32,000 van. That is the point of this. I've been teaching you guys this all along. People are so desperate to get on TV or get you know five minutes of FaceTime, they won't get compensated for it and they'll just go and, and sign the production papers really quick and get on set as fast as they can. And then this poor girl, she sends me this message. Apparently her and Zach had full on hour long, too long conversation about her doing investigations in the past. And they didn't show any of that footage, did they? I mean, point exactly. Post-production is allowed to perceive and is allowed to edit the way they want to. It doesn't even matter. I can guarantee Zach saw the final edit before he sent it in. He made her look like she was afraid. He made it look like he was shocked she got in the van. She definitely was not portrayed as a seasoned investigator. I'm sorry, Annie. I didn't know any of this, obviously. If I would have known you or known about you beforehand, I totally would have, um, you know, gotten the story straight. However, I wasn't there on set when you were filming. I wasn't there for post-production. Therefore, it was not my fault that this is the way you were portrayed to America. And you don't look like you're credible. You know, she's lost her credibility a little bit here. How do you fix that? You know what I mean? Like, I can't, I can't fix it. She's gonna have to do it. But don't take it out on me, man. Like, I'm sorry, I, I love chick investigators. More power to you. Like, I'm all about the feminism in the paranormal, being intelligent, you know, having like 
intelligent conversations about in-depth stuff. I had to address this because I got attacked for it. I didn't know the details of this before. I'm only doing what I do best for my viewers and subscribers, which is calling things as they are. If it's a spade, I'm gonna call it a spade. I'm not gonna dance around it. I'm sorry some people don't like that. I'm sorry you were portrayed that way. I'm sorry it upsets people. However, I'm, I wasn't on the production team. I wanna share some incidences that this exact same thing happened to me well, not exact, but pretty freaking close. I was on set for Paranormal Challenge with Zach. I told you guys we believe Aaron had a serious possession on set. And I had to, I told you, I got called out by Zach and the producers. We ended up filming like an hour long chat, me and Zach. We were talking about, you know, being possessed and how you fix it. Do I need help? Tell me about it, you know, all this stuff. And not a second of it aired on my episode, not a second of it. Another thing is the other team that we were against on Paranormal Challenge, we had to present evidence at the end, which all of you guys know how that worked. And the other team actually, I was told by the producers that uh, they believed a lot of their evidence that they produced was was faked evidence, okay? They didn't think that it was, um, there, like the, there were faces in the mirror that was with the thermo and the producers came into our room, told us the reason it's taking so long is um, it's the whole treason thing with witches. Should they be hung because they basically presented false evidence? The producers told me they believed that the faces in the mirror that the other team presented was some sort of a reflection from them that they caught while they were walking through one of the hotel rooms. They did not disclose at the end that the other team may have presented two out of three or three out of three pieces of evidence that were fake, false, whatever you want to call it, because they were afraid that their team was going to kind of get bashed really bad in the paranormal community. So for saving their image, they tried to make it look like it was fairly even until the end, but the one, you know, EVP was definitely one of their investigators whispering inside of the digital recorder. So that's my point. Post production is allowed to do whatever they want. It doesn't matter. Unless you're an executive producer, which what who knows what an executive producer is, that is one or multiple producers on set that are funding the entire project, which in this case is usually Zach. Then you have three to four producers slash editors. It depends on, it's, most of these jobs can cross over, some can't. So whoever's editing it, Zach usually will see over the top of it. He's the executive producer, he's funding it, it's his museum, and he gets the last call and the last cut. That's just the way it works. That's the way film works. That's another reason why people shouldn't be getting involved in film and television if they're not knowledgeable, it's not just ghost hunting. It's not just paranormal investigating on television. So much more comes into it. It's camera angles, it's lighting work. It's using the right amount of night vision to be able to visibly see if an anomaly comes up in front or using good enough mics that you can pick things up. Because if you don't, you present it to your audience, it's not, it's not legitimate. It's not gonna be good to present to them. Another example that I have to give is I was cast for a show, at the time it was called Notorious Hauntings. Eventually it came out as Killer Contact, okay? You guys can Google it. It ended up getting canceled after its first season. I believe they had four to six episodes come out. I had been cast for that show. This show was one of the shows that they told me they wanted me to be scripted on it, okay? I said, nope, pack sand, I'm leaving. I'm not gonna jeopardize my image. I would rather not be on TV, not be famous, and not look like a horse's ass. However, I did have some friends that were on that show that I knew, and sadly, one of my really good friends is caught on camera several times holding a piece of paper that has a full script on it, and he's literally reading from the paper, basically giving historical facts and questions on how to interview these entities and you know instead of doing it naturally like I'm doing like I'm doing like host work and talking to the camera I don't need a script I don't have things in front of me sometimes I'll have paper for like ideas and bullet points but I don't read from anything and it made these guys that are my friends that have some have worked in production some have done modeling some have done paranormal not all but it made my friends look like idiots and then after the post-production does their thing on this show, they're visibly showing the scripts that they're reading from, and the paranormal community tears them apart. Why? 
Why did the paranormal community tear them apart? Because we know. We are investigators. You have to have confidence, and the confidence comes from experience. You can't sit here and act like you know everything, and I don't, I don't know everything, trust me, don't, don't even start wars about that. You have got to not mess yourself up because it can ruin you, especially in paranormal, and you guys know that. We are picky when it comes to our evidence. We are picky with history and when collaborations go on and using the equipment properly and not calling an EMF meter a microwave meter, you know what I mean? So. This industry is probably harder than any other, and that's because there is science background, there is EMF meters, there's mel meters, there's digital recorders. We're using scientific pieces of equipment to prove these things are here. Plus, we have to know how to do this confidently. We can't be reading off a script. It's not gonna look right, it's not gonna look real, and the paranormal community is gonna tear you apart. And that's why I didn't go on that show. And look at what happened with post-production. My friends, have not done anything since that since that se the season premiered. It was like four to six episodes. I'm sad for everybody involved because it, you know, my one friend that was involved, I'm not mentioning any names, I'm very close with one of the people and he was so embarrassed by what happened, he absolutely refuses to do paranormal investigating in film because he feels like his image was completely ruined all because of post-production. And people in this community they know the difference between crap and real shit. And you don't want to ruin your reputation in this industry because the minute you lose your credibility in the paranormal, nobody's going to believe you anymore. No one's going to follow you. Everyone's going to think that your evidence is not real and it's a bunch of crap and so are you. I've had my experiences with post-production. That's why everyone keeps saying, Crystal, why don't you have a show? We love you. We want to see you on a show. We want to see you investigate. You guys... You're right, I want a show too. Believe me, I want a show. But I am not gonna do a show or sign to a production company until I know everything is right. There is no way I'm gonna ruin my reputation at this point. I am not in this to become famous. I am in this to educate people about paranormal, to teach the difference between real and bull, you know what I mean. And on top of that, I am here because I love this shit. I am passionate about this, it is fun. I don't do BMXing, I don't do motocross, I am not an adrenaline junkie that needs to go on every single roller coaster. My adrenaline is paranormal. I am the biggest advocate for female investigators. People need to remember to read the fine print when you're getting that, you know, contract from the production company. Sometimes the production company has fine print that says we can portray you in any way that we want to. I'm not gonna do this whole subscriber slash YouTuber against other subscribers and YouTubers. Don't start that because I don't have time for it. Like seriously, I'm not in here bashing anybody which is why I'm telling you I'm sorry. And never do something for free. Never. Oh my God, you guys. Would you go to your nine to five job and work for free? If your boss said, hey man, <clears throat> look, I need you to like be in Alaska tomorrow. I need you to work for like three days, <laughs> like nine to five days, and uh, I need you there tomorrow at 9 a.m., but I'm not paying for your flight, I'm not paying for your hotel, I'm not paying for your rental car when you get there, I'm not paying for your food, and oh yeah, you're not getting any salary or compensation once you get to Alaska. Seriously, would you do that for your boss that you work for right now? I'd be like, pack sand, bro. I'm getting a new job. Don't ever work for free. I don't care who you are. Don't ever work for free. What are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? No one is worth free. No one is worth zero. Everyone is worth something. Everyone has something to offer. And if Zach can afford a $32,000 van and he wants you on his show that bad, then he can afford to spot you a couple thousand dollars for your time and complications to get out there. I'm sorry, I know how production works. Production companies have money. Networks have money, a lot of money. Trust me, Zach's television shows, there's a reason that he has Ghost Adventures and Aftershocks and Paranormal Challenge 
and Deadly Possessions, and he did Paranormal Pro Paparazzi. There's a reason he has that many shows, and that's because Travel Channel loves him because he's raking in the green stuff for them. So of course they're gonna keep giving him shows. Don't take zero dollars, what are you doing? Everybody, and this is not just about the Travel Channel. This is in general, never work for free. All right, I'm dropping the mic, guys. This is my invisible microphone, and I'm out, and I'll see you later. We're back from dead.